it's seldom that you can date precisely when there's a major change in a human institution, let alone in a monetary institution. But you know, it's an interesting fact that, uh, that you can date precisely a really drastic change in the character of the monetary system around the world. And you can date it on August 15th, 1971. That's the date on which Richard Nixon finally ended the supposed agreement by the U.S. government to sell gold for $35 an ounce to foreign governments. And that was the final nail in the coffin of the kind of monetary system that had prevailed from the beginning of time, so far as you can see. That is, all, all monetary systems before that were commodity systems based on a commodity, whether it was silver or gold or other things. From August 15, 1971, no national currency in the world is any longer based on a, on a commodity. You know, when people talk about money, they think it means something. But what in the world is the money that people use today? But even then, the, the, the money that we used was not in any meaningful way connected to gold. I mean, it was just paper, as it is today. It was a long yeah. time, you know. Uh, literal commodities were used as money for centuries, for millennia. When you go back, whether you go back to Greece or Rome, they used silver coins or gold coins. Earlier than that, the first recorded kind of money was a mixture uh, of gold and, and silver. It wasn't a deliberate mixture. It was a mixture that came out of the earth in the form of, what was it they called it? The earliest, uh, it was a king somewhere in Arabia who discovered this amalgam. And that's what they used as money. He was the first one who, who put a stamp on it and said, this is money. This is to be taken as having a certain value. And as late as the 19th century, I guess, most monetary transactions were actually made with coins. Well, but by the 1850s, the uh, um, uh, most actual transactions were either written with checks, like they are today, or uh, with bills that but they act, banks. But at least if you're using bills, they act as if it was a commodity because there was this underlying right. relationship right. between a piece of paper and some number of, of ounces of gold someplace or some number of, of weight of, co of commodity someplace. I think what's happened then is since 1971 is we've had a pure fiat standard where it's just the whim of a government as to what our money's going to be worth. But we were pretty close to that even before. So the well, a dollar, you know, it used to be, if you took out a dollar bill, it was used to say on that dollar bill, the United States of government promises to pay one dollar. It used to say. Now it doesn't right. say that. Hasn't said that for a long time. N oh, it's not so long. <laughs> You're young. <laughs> In my lifetime, <laughs> right. it's not so long. I think it's I was only a kid when it changed. What? I was a kid when it changed. Yeah. I'm not sure you were. I think it only changed in about 1960 or when they went off silver certificates. I think so. I think when well, a mixture they thing. finally yeah. ended, for a long time, the government had a policy of, uh, of a fixed price for silver. <coughs> And they didn't go off that until something like the 1950s or 60s at Bertzingbrunner. Right. But um, now it just says, the United States of America, one dollar. Now what really gives it some meaning, it said this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Right. Now what does that mean? Well, that's the way the government defines what the unit is. The that means that when I have a debt with someone, I could present that bill, and if they don't receive it, well, they've not, they've failed to fulfill their portion. No, but contract. that's only true if the debt is in, in dollars. Is in dollars. That's right, sure. That's it's the only it's thing that's really good for is government payment. Well, no, wait, 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 no. See, if a contract is written in dollars, it's then the question that the court has to decide, what does the word dollar mean? Yeah. Okay, and then at the Article One of the Constitution gives Congress the power to decide what the word dollar means. It's just like Article One also says, the Congress has to decide how long the yard is or how big the gallon is. And one of the things the government does is it decides units of weight, measure, and value. And the dollar is the unit of value. And it's given meaning to that by saying this piece of paper is what we mean by the dollar. Now, what's amazing is that people accept that. You know, this meaningless well, scrap of paper is, uh, is taken to have value. One of the things I find in the course of years of talking about money to lots of people, the hardest thing people have to accept, find it. The thing they find it hardest to understand is that literally 
there are 19 people sitting around a table in Washington who have the power to have t twice as many dollars or half as many dollars or ten times as many dollars. Okay. That the, the, the people, you know, people think that the number of dollars in existence is somehow determined by some physical or technical or some other rule. The idea that there's just this, who are these 19 people? Seven governors of the Federal Reserve System plus 12 presidents of Federal Reserve Banks. Not all of them have a vote. Only five of them have a vote. But uh, seven governors plus the five bank presidents can vote what to do about the amount of money. And there's absolutely no other control except the indirect control that the Congress could pass a law changing their powers. Yeah. Well, the amazing thing about that group is that or they the regularly contemplate changing the unit of measure. It's as if, remember, there's one other person that we never talk about, which is the director of the National Bureau of Standards, who determines how long the yard is. We never think about changing the length of the yard, but regularly the people you're talking about shrink the dollar, get smaller, a little bit smaller. Every uh, year it's as if we had a shrinking yardstick. Well, well, it's amazing that we had Not in dollar. terms of the definition, it's still the legal tender no, for No, but that. the purchasing power. We, to, back to the original point, we also have an indirect way. If our president causes or acts in such a way that we have higher rates of inflation, we tend to vote them out, which is probably the leading reason Jimmy Carter was thrown out and also the labor government was and Mar Margaret Thatcher came in. So there is some kind of a very uh, tenuous check on their acting. Oh, I think it's, it's, it's better acting than that. I mean, one, one of the interesting there. things is not only does the U.S. have this system, but uh, Japan and Germany and many other countries have the system, and it delivers really a remarkably stable currency in spite of the fact that uh, the, all the elements of instability are there, and yet the performance of the system, especially in the last 10 years in the United States, for example, is, has really not been bad. In spite but of all the these interesting changes. thing is, you see that until, until August 15, 1971, there was at least the pretense that it was not being determined by 12 people, right. that it was really being determined somehow or other by the link which it had to gold. If you go really pretense, way though. back, yeah. it was a... Well, you correctly called it a pretense. Oh, it was a pretense. It wasn't a pretense to begin with, if you go no, back to the... It, yeah. uh, if you go back to what happened when gold was discovered in California in 1848, it was very far from a pretense that the quantity of money was being determined by how much gold there was. Well, it's not the quantity doesn't matter, it's the value of the money. The, the value of the money declined when gold became more plentiful. Yeah, it became more, it declined because there was more of it. The quantity, the value of the money is not unrelated to the quantity of money. Just, just argue in favor a little bit of this, this fiat standard. One of, one of the things that's, that's good about <coughs> it is society is not really forced to go and take gold out of the ground and, and s or silver out of the ground and put it someplace in order to create a money, s money s system. So if the government's doing its job correctly, that is having a, a non-inflationary growth rate of the money supply, then we could have this fiat money, this pieces of paper, instead of the gigantic expenditure of resources on necessary to pull gold out of the ground, being our money stock as a, and save a lot of resources that we could use elsewhere. In the That's an argument yeah. I often made, I used to make, and I'm not so confident about it anymore. I used to say it's just simply absurd Wait, the system's to working dig better gold now. out of the ground in South Africa in order to bury it under the ground in New York in the vaults of the Federal Reserve Bank. But since I've observed the operation of this fiat money standard, it isn't costless either. It isn't costless because it introduces so much uncertainty into the world about what's going to happen. You're the, right. The, the point is, in the best of all worlds, <coughs> savings of resources, if governments do the correct thing from the, from the beginning, it would be the best of, but best have of you all worlds. When have you no, known governments to behave as if it's the best of all worlds? I've looked at well, a wait, few they, of them in my shorter they, lifetime, they, and they always do things wrong. And, but the U.S. government, in the last 10 years, uh, has delivered a more stable purchasing power of money than we had under the gold standard. Now, I admit that's only a 10-year period. That depends on what period before that, last 10 years, I can name I other 10-year periods in which that was true. Yeah, okay. I'm just you, saying that it's not, it's not an impossible. Year, you can take a 10-year period, for example, I don't think that's from uh, 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 1896 to oh, really a 17-year period from about 1898, let's say, to 1914, in which you had a very regular up thing, but it was very stable. It With stable, stable inflation. Yeah, that stable period was very inflation. similar to what we've had in the yeah, last 10 Yeah, and years. you can take a period from about oh, uh, 1920, 
2 to 29 when it was very stable horizontally, seven years. Right. Some governments do a good job, however, with their monetary policy, and I think something that's interesting is why is the United States, which is where we invented monetarism, where you invented monetarism, why have we done such a bad job, and why have the Japanese done such a good job, and why well, have the British not even oh. admitted that monetarism is a sensible view? But hold on for a moment. Have the ja you take the Japanese sure. again, you're very time-bound. Until 1973, they did a very lousy job. Until 1973. They yeah. were up and down all the time. Yeah, that's right. There was more price instability in Japan. Yeah. It's well, since Greenspan has taken over the Fed in my business, which is money management field, we've talked about the Japanization of U.S. monetary policy, where you have the sensation that Alan Greenspan is actually trying to follow the monetary policy that the Japanese have followed in their good period, and he's trying to reverse the monetary policy that the United States followed before he came into po office. But yes. if you take the period, take Japan, go back. Okay. 73, they had a revolution, they, they changed because inflation had zoomed up to 25%. There was a feeling something had to be done about it. And they did, from then on, have a very good monetary policy until about 1988. And then they went off again. When the U.S. Yeah. government essentially... And it was our fault. The, the US, U.S. government, Jim Baker and, and his gang, went to the Louvre Accord and said, Japan, you've got to help us do your thing, so we want the yen to go to, uh, to, to be devalued. No, no, no you want the dollar. Want, yeah, want the, the dollar. dollar is too strong. The dollar is too strong, so dollar, help so. us do that. And they have since, by <coughs> the Japanese, <coughs> well, Japanese at growth at rates. At the plaza, no, at the no, Louvre no, Agreement, they, they wanted to support the dollar. Support the dollar. They wanted to s stop oh, okay, the it's decline the plaza, in the yeah, dollar. Okay, right, that's right. the Louvre and Accords, that's the 86. Caused, that's what caused the Japanese to print so much money. They went from 8.8 .8 to higher rates of growth rates in their M2 plus CDs, which is what they tend to look at. But now Japanese growth rates of money are down to about 2%. And this is part of the problem that's that's causing Japan's yeah, I mean, Japan fall right in now is their economy right now. Remarkable. Well, similarly, attraction. if you take Germany, Germany has done a relatively good job. Right. Uh, now, w it's interesting. One of the interesting phenomenon to me is how long people's memory is. There's no doubt the reason Germany has done such a good job is in considerable part because from 1918 to 1922, 23, 24 they suffered a tremendous yeah, inflation, spectacularly hyperinflation. Bad, right. You know, people don't realize what hyperinflation is. People in the United States complain about prices rising. But in, in Germany at that time, they paid wages three times a day after breakfast, lunch, and dinner so people could go out and spend the money before it lost its value. And well, it was once. a good idea to buy two beers at once because the, the price of the second beer went up faster than the beer went flat. <laughs> and so there are pictures in my textbook where people would walk around with wheelbarrows of money right. to, to uh, make their pays. Well, well, that, know, that's a famous. very extreme. I mean, that's a John Maynard Keynes made that crack once. He said when he was in Russia during this period and he saw a man rushing with a wheelbarrow of money, he said for the first time he knew what velocity of circulation <laughs> <laughs> really meant. What, one of the interesting things right now going on is just watching some of the things that happen in, in Russia where I, I was recently there and experienced 40 percent, 50 percent a month inflation. And this is to people who have known price stability in their mind for years and years and years. And you go from fixed prices where everything was fixed by the government to this crazy system where prices are moving at 50 percent a month. It's left them breathless. They're dumbfounded. They just don't even know what, how to make any sense out of it. And it's, it's interesting watching the, these poor countries of Eastern Europe and, and the ex-Soviet Union undergo the, these dramatic changes right now. Mm -hmm. Once again, it's because their money doesn't mean anything there. It's just pieces of paper. Well, if you come back to the United States for a moment and come back to general attitudes about money, I suppose one of the real difficulties about people understanding money is distinguishing going back to something you were saying, Bob, distinguishing between the number of pieces of paper, the number of units, right. and what that number of units will buy, what, what economists call the nominal amount of money versus the real amount of money. And to an ordinary person, it seems kind of curious. Let's suppose these 12, 19 people sitting around a table suddenly decided that the quantity of money should be increased, and everybody f got more money somehow, let's not ask about the process. Each individual separately would think he was better off. And yet the economy as a whole might be very much worse off. And that's why I think, when you ask the question, why is it that countries have inflation to do something? 
that almost everybody agrees after the event was a bad thing. I don't believe there's anybody in Argentina who thinks it was a good thing that they had inflation rates of 100, 200 percent a year. I don't think there's any, there are very few people in the United States who think it was a good thing that during the 1970s inflation was allowed to go up until in 1980 it was in the neighborhood of 20 percent. And yet we do it. And that's really a puzzle, isn't it? Why is it? But it, it speaks to the more general problem of the failure of government. Uh, and the governments fail very characteristically in the same direction. They promise too much, they generate too little revenue, uh, and it often, you know, the hyperinflations we talked about are, are generally related to that phenomenon of the government uh, printing money in desperation to try to honor its spending I promises. I think it's also, and in the case of the U.S. in the 70s, it was probably, I think you've even mentioned this, it's the first round. They didn't know how strong this tiger was that they had, uh, had unleashed when they got rid of gold back in the early 70s. And that was the first round. Now politicians now know that if you let inflation go up to 20% in the United States, your party's out of power for right. 15 that's years. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. That's and this is now the case that the, the, those 19 people might say, well, I'm going to give in to the pressure. But the person who's the president says, well, if you give in to the pressure, we're out of power for 20 years. And he's going to be very upset about that. Is he? <laughs> is he? I've just been observing that over the last year, Mr. Bush has been trying to urge the Federal Reserve to go more, more uh, to print more money, to yeah, ease but conditions. But as he clear, calls the rate of inflation has declined during that period. Rate of inflation he has was, declined, but the it's president's still been saying, "Let's keep inflation at, at the four to five percent level where it was before, and now it's dropped to three percent." I, I agree that was the wrong thing for him to do. I also yeah. agree that the political calculus that he went through in order to allow for an increase in marginal tax rates was an incorrect one. And I don't understand what he gained by doing that either. So if you're saying we have an irrational person who's not maximizing his political support, well, I'll have to agree. I'll I'll accept no, some of that. But suppose we were, t we're, we're thinking of the public at large here now, uh, of everybody in the United States. Money is, you're right that it's a special example of a more general problem of government failing to achieve what it seeks to do. But it's a particularly important problem. Oh, There's yeah. nothing yeah. else right. no, which, right. if it goes wrong, does so much harm. And uh, the interesting thing is that I, you very seldom have seen any structural suggestions, suggestions for really changing the system in a way which would make money a better servant and a less cruel master. Well, you and I have both put we a both lot of persuasive oh, effort of, into that. Lots of We've just been ones. unsuccessful, is that what you're saying? Because <laughs> we Yes, tried. we have been unsuccessful, absolutely. We haven't been able to persuade the public at large. We haven't persuaded, been able to persuade the powers that be. <coughs> well, in some sense, it hasn't been that bad. Yeah, I think that's right. It's not. It's I mean, it's not like our school systems or something like right. that. But it is. It. it Inflation it, it, is not at the top of the list of. of it isn't at the moment. No, 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 no. By the time you bring it down to three or four percent right. a year, no. which it is now, and of course, it's not too easy to measure. What is three or four percent a year in what? Some prices are going up. Some are going down. Uh, Medical care is going as up. As a computer is user. Down. Yes, uh, that's right. I yeah. know that there's been big deflation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And lots of things. S automobiles. Automobiles are more expensive in dollars, but they're much cheaper in terms of the number of months you have to work to get one than they ever were. Right. And moreover, the quality of them has improved enormously. So it isn't all one way. And yeah. yet, it seems to me that for s not only in the United States, but elsewhere, uh, it's fascinating that there's been so little attention to money and what it can do and how much harm it can do when it goes wrong. And we have the thing we haven't done is build in any protection against repetition uh, of the disasters of the 1970s or even worse, which uh, could happen. I mean, the, the, no. the federal government is drifting in the direction of, of a true uh, fiscal emergency sometime in the next. Uh, five, ten, fifteen years, and that could be accompanied by the kind of a of a severe inflation emergency that we've not had for a long time. But that's I think it's you know the time to act would be now in terms of, of trying course, to make so a structural far, reform. So far as the public at large is concerned, inflation to them means higher prices, and to them they look at higher prices as being set by business enterprises, and the most popular explanations of inflation are not those we've been talking about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The most